Building North American crude supply chain of technology and analysis behind the measurements. Um, we'll kick off in just a few minutes with our presenters. We have Paolo Neri, the Senior Director of EMEA Oil at Genscape, as well as Brian Bush, Director of Oil Market and Business Development. As we go through the presentation today, if you have any questions, just use the questions box on the right side of your screen in the panel, and our presenters will get to it at the end. Um, and I'm just going to turn it over now to Paolo and Brian. Hey, Brian, just um, I think you haven't unmuted yourself. Thank you, Molly. I appreciate all of you joining us here today. I believe you will find our presentation informative and hopefully useful. The theme for today's presentation is the return of WTI's relevance. We are going to compare Genscape's Cushing data to the EIA data, which you all are all familiar with. I'm going to discuss the methodologies and procedures that we follow to measure tank inventories from the air. Then what really matters, we're going to take a look at how it affects the markets. And finally, we're going to look beyond Cushing and even beyond North America at completing the fundamentals picture. So kind of to borrow a quote from Mark Twain, which WTI could do, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Over the past five years, we've seen crude oil trade over fairly extreme ranges. WTI itself has traded over a dollar, uh, over $140, and lower than $32.50. The spreads have been just as exciting. With WTI's 12-month calendar spread trading from a $20 to con contango to recently touching $12.50 backwardation. At one point, WTI spiked for a day to more than $10 over Brent, but recently has traded as low as $27.88 under. The increase in crude oil production in the continental U.S., in the Eagleford, the Balkan Shell plays, along with enhanced production from the more traditional areas, concerns over storage capacity and limited pipeline capacity to move adequate volumes of crude out of Cushing all combined to cause WTI weakness and the associated NYMEX contract. They actually seem to disconnect from the rest of the global crude market. I've heard many people say that WTI is no longer relevant. Well, how quickly some things can change. Let's take a look just at what's happened over the last six months. Um, we saw WTI strengthen against Brent last week and actually trade below $1.30 before settling into a 2 to $3.50 range. Although last week's price action got everyone's attention, the relative strength of WTI and the other mid-continent grades has been a slow, steady march over the last six to eight months. As you can see by the graph in front of you right now, the other U.S. grades, which still had to compete with other foreign waterborne deliveries into the coastal refinery complexes, such as LS, LLS, continued to track and be connected to Brent and the global crude market. But WTI in the mid-continent grades significantly disconnected. But over the last six months, we've seen that gap close from over $20 to now into that 2 to $3 range, and we expect to see WTI strength continue. It's not just the spread to Brent that has significantly changed over the last six months. We have also seen the structure of WTI change. This graph is demonstrating what's happened over the front-to-back spreads, the time spreads, the calendar spreads, one month, a three-month, a six-month, and a 12-month. And just in the last six months, we've seen the 12-month spread actually go out to over 1250 for a day. And one of the things I want you to notice about this particular graph is those four spikes right towards the end. Um, we're going to talk about an event that occurred last week that actually created 
those particular spikes. But we saw the front month, the July-August spread, trade above 95 cents. Uh, that's a very significant change in the spreads and what's going on in the market. If we look at this graph, one of the things that we know is helping cause this or create, bring things back to normality is the concern over storage capacity at Cushing. Was it filling up? Was there good insights to, to where it's been? Well, Genscape has monitored a storage capacity increase of over 50%. And storage capabilities are now approaching 80 million barrels of crude just at Cushing, Oklahoma. The utilization of Cushing has been hard pressed to really top 70% since that capacity exceeded 75 million barrels. So there is now plenty of room at Cushing. You combine that with the additional takeaway capacity, which we'll discuss a little later. They have changed the fundamental picture for physical WTI and the NYMEX CL contract. It is reconnected with the global crude market, and it would take another fundamental change to see it disconnect again. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the EIA's weekly and monthly numbers, including the assessment of crude oil for inventories at Cushing, Oklahoma. For years, the EIA has kind of been the accepted number, and we're going to take a look at both the Genscape number and the EIA numbers. There are some things that differentiate Genscape's storage number at Cushing and everywhere else. And I think it's important for you to understand what those differences are. First, and probably most importantly, as you will shortly see, we provide Friday's measurement on Monday morning. That's two days ahead of the EIA. And it's two days in front of the market for anybody that doesn't subscribe to that data. Second, we provide it a lot more often. Twice a week, we report on 385 tanks at Cushing, Oklahoma alone, and provide that storage information by tank-by-tank -tank basis. So in addition to getting it faster, getting it more often, you also get a lot more detail on it. You then have access to history going back to 2009, and we track those infrastructure builds, the utilization, the maintenance, those things that can actually change the fundamental picture, we monitor those and put those out in intelligence reports as well. So let's take a look at how Genscape stacks up against the EIA data. Earlier this year, we received questions quite often when our weekly storage report didn't line up exactly with the EIA report. So in a couple of minutes, as I go through and share with you the details of how we measure the inventory, but first let's actually compare these numbers so that you get an understanding of, of how well they correlate and how well they align. On a weekly basis, the EIA assesses inventories. Every asset operator is required, required to file a report with the EIA with their estimates for their weekly ending inventory. Once a month, at the end of the month, the EIA requires the operators to actually measure the inventory in their tank. One difference that Genscape reports on total inventory based on shell capacity of the tanks, the EIA actually adjusts for an operational inventory based on heels and tank bottoms. So when you look at the graph that's attached right now, you'll see that the Genscape number in the EIA month ending numbers. When both people actually measure inventory, we have a correlation of over 98%. Now, oftentimes, it's not the outright number that interests everybody as much as it is the change in that number. So if we look at the week-over-week -week change that is reported by EIA and compare it to Genscape, you'll see that we actually have a correlation of 95% and we track very, very well with what 
they actually end up reporting at the end of the month. So you've got very comparable numbers, very good numbers. Genscape comes out with the weekly number two days early. We come up with the month ending number a couple of months early, but the EIA consistently um, confirms those numbers. Now when we look at the weekly information, then if you look on a week by week basis where the EIA only assesses the operators, there is greater variability. We actually only see an 82% correlation on a week by week basis. However, if you look at the four week rolling average, the correlation on that number goes all the way up to 92%. We believe that the inconsistencies and the errors that are inherent in any kind of a measurement or an assessment like that get smoothed out over the four week period of time. And as they get smoothed out, the numbers come back together. We believe the measured Genscape number is a, a better, more accurate number on a week-by-week -week basis. So let's take a look at Cushing in depth, and let's take a look at how we actually monitor inventory. How do we do it? Well, it all starts by knowing our facilities and understanding them. So there's a great deal of research that has to go into each facility. The picture you're looking at right now is the South Terminal at Cushing. So we go out and we gather data. We do tank-by-tank -tank measurements using some proprietary technology. We summary of the data and bring it together. And then we check, we check intelligence, market changes. We look at destruction of capacity. We look at construction of capacity. And we watch for when stuff goes into maintenance and goes out of service. The capacity number we report is only in-service tanks. So the detailed research at the field, this is an overhead of the storage facilities at Cushing. You can see that we've identified each individual tank in the field. We know who owns it. We know whether it's a fixed roof tank or a floating roof tank. And you can see the little wrench symbol. That's where we mark when we currently have tank that's in maintenance and it is not open for operation. We remove those from the capacity at the time. So in Cushing, twice a week and then at the end of the month, we fly over the fields, and we have our pilots actually fly at the same elevation. We have them fly the same geographical path. We use high-resolution cameras, infrared cameras, and some proprietary technology to help us gather pictures and gather information on the tanks. We do this at the end of the week to coincide with the EIA data as well as the end of the month, and then on Tuesday to provide an interim look at where we believe the inventories are headed. Consistency in this flight and data gathering is one of the most important things. Um, we need the same angle on the tank so that our measurements are consistent from week to week. The one thing that can mess us up is bad weather. We don't have any control of that, and in the case of bad weather, um, we fly as close as possible to the same time, uh, and, and if we get bad pictures because of weather, we use the most recent information on that tank, but we highlight that we are using a previous uh, day's information. So how do we measure each tank? We review almost a thousand tanks in North America at least once a week. We have fixed and floating, and these are examples of both a floating roof tank and then a fixed roof tank and how we measure them. The image set at the top is a floating roof tank on two separate days. This particular tank has a capacity of 50,000 barrels. The left image is currently 78% full, and the right shows it at 24% full. 
the infrared images that you're looking below are the fixed roof tanks on two separate days. The upper left tank has a capacity of 493 barrels. In the left image, it is 53% full. In the right image, as you can see by how much larger the dark section is, it's actually 78% full. And again, if for reasons we are not able to um, get a good picture, we use the most current information that we have. Then we gather all of that tank-by-tank -tank data, and we roll that information up. So all of the t we, we have it at tank level, we then have it at operator level, and then that gets rolled up finally into a field level. So you can understand what's going on at Cushing by that single number. We've had storage increase by 2.5%. We've had it decrease by 2.5%. Or you can dig down into the data, find out who is moving inventory out, or where is it moving to. In addition to providing the measurement reports, we also provide intelligence on a regular basis. And we send out alerts as we know that. In this particular case, we have a tank that is in maintenance. If you look at the top left picture, you see the little box down at the bottom. Um, looks like the little square. That's where they've actually opened the tank. They drive in and out. Um, we will see that sealed up. We'll see hoses attached. We'll know when they hydro test it. And we'll know when it then goes back into service. Directly below that, is a picture of a destruction of a tank. We know that this is going out of service forever. Uh, the middle two pictures are both pictures of construction of new tankage going on. And then there are special events. Uh, the lower right-hand picture is of the fires that were going on in Oklahoma approaching Cushing last year. Fortunately, they never did get there and create any serious problems. So we've kind of focused on Cushing going through how we do the measurements. So let's get outside of Cushing for a second. We also report on Canada. In Canada, we look at the Hardesty Cavern, the storage at Hardesty, Corrobert, and Edmonton. We also monitor Potoka, Midland, and Basin. Most recently, we've added the St. James Storage and Rail Discharge facilities to our reports. In total, we measure over 1,000 tanks in North America every single week and 385 tanks twice a week for a total storage capacity of over 190 million barrels a week. So let's take a look at what really matters, which is how does this fundamental data affect or play into the market? So we're going to look at a couple of examples, and they're recent examples. A week ago Monday, at 9 o'clock, Genscape reported a 2 million barrel draw in crude oil at Cushing, Oklahoma. That night, the crude opened at midnight in the overnight trading at over a dollar four for the August contract. The market had a lot of weakness. It had traded down to a dollar two by 8:45. At nine o'clock, Genscape releases the information on the two million barrel draw. That trading trend immediately reversed. We traded up 50 cents in about 15 minutes, and we traded up to a dollar 45 in the next hour and a half to $1.357. Uh, that market continued to slide a little sideways. Once we got confirmation from EIA on Wednesday and the rest of the market joined in, we saw crude march up approaching $1.06. But it wasn't just the outright price of crude that saw significant moves. We also saw the calendar spread change. And we saw the calendar spread change from 12 cents prior to the release of the Genscape information. By Tuesday, it was trading at 50 cents. And after Genscape confirmed the draw, 
it traded all the way up above 95 cents for a period of time. The WTI Brent spread was also dramatically affected. The spread was at $4.55 when Genscape first released the inventory draw. It traded down to 350 and down to 308 and then when Genscape number was confirmed by the EIA, it traded hard again down and actually in the overnight trading um, traded around a dollar thirty a dollar twenty five depending because it, it's a serious it's a trading opportunity or is it an opportunity lost so just a quick look at the numbers Monday nine o'clock Genscape releases a significant draw at Cushing Oklahoma the WTI Brent standing at 450. By Wednesday at 10 o'clock, before the EIA releases their number, that spread had come in to $3.08. It closed Wednesday at 215. You had the same kind of move in the WTI month one, month two, if you had wanted to trade that. So if you look at what you would have left on the table, because 61% of the move in WTI Brent was over before WTI numbers were released by the EIA, and 49% of the calendar spread was over. That would have equaled $185,000 on a 100-contract 100, position. Another thing that affects is alerts and news that we put out. After all of that weakness, or all of that strength we showed in the WTI market, and the, the weakening of the Brent spread, the weakening of the front to back, um, on Tuesday morning we came in and Seaway, the pipeline went down. We released an alert detecting the shutdown of the Seaway pipeline from an estimated 300,000 barrels down to nothing. We saw the first pump go down, and we saw the other three pumps follow that. We issued our alert. And the graphs you see in front of you are the market reaction with WTI weakening significantly, the Brent spread coming back, and the front to back falling off. All of those happening almost immediately upon the release of the alert identifying that the Seaway pipeline was shut down. So as one of those take away capacities from Cushing down to the refining complexes disappeared. The concern about WTI becoming constrained again, about crude being trapped in the Midwest of the U.S. again and not being able to get out had an immediate impact. Now by 12 o'clock, six hours later, the pipeline had come back up. Fear subsided and everything started trading sideways again. So let's take a look at some of the fundamentals beyond just Cushing storage. And we've seen the example just a minute ago from the pipeline. But there are other things that have changed the overall fundamental picture that have helped significantly change what the WTI structure and the relationship to the global crude market. One of those is as rail has become an important part of the logistics in the U.S., Prior to the growth in the Shell Play and the Balkan and the Eagleford, rail did not play a significant role for crude oil in the U.S. Now, even though the economics that encouraged actually rail delivery over pipeline for a while, when the WTI Brent spread was out to $15, $16, it actually was economical to ship your crude via rail if you could get it there and sell it into the Gulf Coast market against LL Economics or move it to the other coasts than it was to try and sell against the WTI marker. We've lost those economics, but if you look at the trend, we still see the overall rail loadings going up. Um, you see one little blip on this chart. That's where we actually lost some cameras and were not able to monitor some of the loadings for a few days. Um, 
but look at the overall trend. We're up to almost an average of 700,000 barrels a day that are being moved in North America by rail. We also put out pipeline reports on a weekly basis and rail reports identifying pipelines that are shutting down, they're slowing down, they're under maintenance, and we're looking at the rail facilities in Albany and the West Coast as well. We send out alerts anytime we see pipelines go down, and we also alert on refineries. On the right-hand side, you see a picture of the Holly Frontier El Dorado refinery. You see the smoke, the discharge coming from the stack, and you also see the unit that is starting to heat up. So when we see activity changes at refineries we monitor, we also alert on those. And then we get individual detail available to you on each pipeline, what pumping stations we actually monitor, and a hour-by-hour -hour monitoring of what the run rates are on our dashboard. And then we report on infrastructure, new development, what's building on so that you understand what the fundamentals are going to look like in three months, six months, and a year so that you can prepare for the long-term moves like we've seen in WTI changing its position again in the global market. And along with that, we provide diagrams as we do our investigation, as we do our research into fields, pipelines, we create diagrams, and these are available to customers as well. So going beyond North America, I want to turn it over to Apollo Neri, and he's going to tell you a little bit of what we're doing outside of North America. Thanks so much, Brian. It's not quite the same picture in the rest of the world. Uh, I think the, the point we were aiming to make here on this uh, presentation is that the Brent WTI correlations are impacted by fundamentals on both sides. We can bring a lot to the, to the uh, fuller understanding of that Brent WTI spread um, just on the American side. On the European side, what Genscape does that's closely connected to Brent is the monitoring of the 40s pipeline. That's a relatively new uh, undertaking for us, and it's also a highly complex undertaking for us. Am I paging forward or someone else? Sorry. Um, but um, the, the, the 40s, there we go, the 40s supply chain monitor, which is our key product that correlates to Brent, is monitoring the um, output of the 40s field. What we found, it's very, very different from uh, Cushing. Cushing is uh, largely visible from a lot of angles, um, and um, it's a relatively simple uh, storage facility. Here, we have storage at a refinery, we have a gas fractionating unit, we have a very complicated pipeline system coming in from the North Sea. Uh, we're monitoring all of the above and presenting that as a daily oil balance. So we're monitoring the ships. As you can see in the bottom table of there, vaguely, there's a, uh, a, a monitoring of all the different uh, ins and outs to that system. The, the supply into Grangemouth, the, the ships that dock at Hound Point and take oil away, uh, the change in the storage at Dalmany, which is the uh, key storage facility there. And what we found, through page forward, um, on occasion, here's one instance where um, we reported that the pipeline 40s, uh, the 40s pipeline flow had been stopped because of some sort of uh, disruption. Uh, we were able to put those out as alerts, and where that crosshair is, more or less, the uh, 9, 9 a.m., 9.30 on the 6th is where that supply got stopped. And you can see the market started to move fairly quickly up from there on that uh, shift. And of course, it came back, and the market fell off again. And there's an, a couple of instances along here where the 40s went up and down. Um, there's a pretty tight correlation on what we're finding on extreme events. It isn't quite as regular as we see with Cushing, where it's a weekly event and you know it's going to happen. Uh, but the value of the 40s report, while it's far more complex, is showing itself when there are very extreme events. In page board. 
And the other thing we're doing in Europe, and this is the first, uh, the first uh, report on the left there is the gas oil storage report. We've been doing that for almost a year. Um, and just as of two weeks ago, in fact, today was our third issue of the our crude storage report, and that is a similar concept to the Cushing. We're reporting all of the approximately 195 tanks that are carrying crude oil in the ARA region. Most of them are in Rotterdam, for anyone who knows these things. And um, we have yet to determine what that's going to be correlating to, but there's a great deal of interest on the market. Um, it's beginning to show that um, the, the crude inventories there are important, but um, as we progress over the next couple of months, we're going to be adding more layers to this report with uh, similar to what we've done with uh, 40s where the ship traffic in and out, which is what clients are asking for so far, and the refinery runs. But this is a very new report and will uh, have to prove itself shortly. And move it forward a little bit. Thank you. Oh, that was the end. Um, so we, we got some questions. Brian, you want to take this one here? I'll read it out to you. It's um, from Mohammed Asori, who's asked if the um, uh, relevance of Cushing storage, uh, what it might be now in view of the ongoing pipeline and rail that's coming in and out of Canada, especially directly to refineries. I think part of that answer is simply the fact that the market trades off of them. Uh, but Brian, you might have some other views on this to, to add. Yeah, uh, Cushing storage, I think, is going to continue to be relevant and actually become even more relevant as we move forward. Um, when we saw some, some real concerns over was there adequate capacity at storage uh, at Cushing, um, we could see extremely volatile price swings. As it becomes evident to everybody that there is more and more information, more and more storage capacity available at Cushing, it can take the pressure off of interruptions in delivery from pipelines to some degree. Uh, it's not like you are worried about having to shut in wells. When you've got 30% capacity on 80 million barrels, then if we lose Seaway for a couple of days, although it will absolutely have an impact on price, you don't have people worried about, we have no place to put crude. Now, as for rail, rail's going to continue to play a very significant part as well. Um, there's just not the pipeline capacity out there to take crude out of Balkan, even out of Eagleford, um, and, and get it into the more traditional crude delivery mechanisms within the U.S. Uh, rail has got to continue to play a very significant role. Um, without that, then you're going to have to have substantial building of pipeline, and at that point, then even more capacity will be required at Cushing. That's the only question we've had so far. Anyone else before we pull the plug? All right. Okay. Give it just another second. All right. I guess we'll uh, say thank you to everyone for attending. And uh, appreciate your attention, your time, and hope that was of some value. Feel free to reach out to uh, anyone in our analyst team or our sales team or indeed uh, Brian and myself anytime. Our emails are on the last screen there. Thank you, Pello. Um, this is Jamie from the marketing team. Thank you for joining us today. And we just wanted to add that we'd appreciate if you would take the short survey once you exit the webinar. Thanks again for coming.